what a friend we have in Jesus. That's a great line to say to ourselves and to hear repeated for us as we come into this place this morning. So good morning. morning. Great to be together today on this brisk, bracing day. And if you are joining us online, we're glad that you can be a part of the service as well. You know, it's possible to build a life without God. People do this all the time. It's also possible to build a life with God. And as we come together today, it's, uh, it's an expression of that desire that we have to build a life with God, to incorporate God into every aspect of our lives. So we give time over to worship, but this is not the only time that we think about God during the week. In faith, we walk believing that God accompanies us wherever we go. But it is a special time to be together and to focus our attention on the Lord, who is such a good friend to us. And so as we gather this morning to worship, let us be mindful again of this one who cares for us, who loves us, whose grace is poured out on us, who seeks to accompany us through every dimension, every aspect of our lives. Let's pray together. Loving and gracious God, praise be to your holy name. As we come into this place, as we set aside this time, Lord, would you fill our hearts with the sense of your presence? Would you draw us close to you? Would you remind us that you are with us? We're grateful for the opportunity to worship. We join our voices with many who have been doing this already over the weekend and who are yet to gather for worship later today. God, help us to sense your presence. Help us to be open to the changes you're calling for, to draw on the resources that you provide, to move in the love that you make possible. We ask your blessing on our time together and commit it to you now through Christ. Amen. I'm going to ask Bob and Leslie Richardson to come and join me up here for a few moments. We are welcoming Bob and Leslie into membership today, and I wanted you to have a chance to meet them and get to know a little bit about their background as they join together with this congregation. So this is Leslie and this is Bob Richardson. They have recently moved to the area from Mahanoy City in Schuylkill County. Is that close enough? Yes, that's perfect. Oh, that'll be the last time I do that. Right then. Thank you. (laughs) But um, I wanted to ask if you could just tell us a little bit about yourselves, kind of how you met, maybe what some of your interests might be. always knew each other. Um, Bob's family, his dad was in the Navy, so they had lived away for a few years, but when I started kindergarten, it's not, I, I promise this story is not going to take you through every year of my life until then, but um, I became friends with one of his sisters. Um, so, you know, we knew each other over the years. I spent time at his house. Uh, we were in activities together. We went to the same um, sister churches, so we, you know, we worshiped together. Um, and then when we started high school, uh, Bob was, a, he was a little bit older than I was and he was a big basketball star and I was a band geek so we sort of didn't travel in the same circles. Uh, but when I was a senior in high school, he worked for a business right across the street from me and we started talking and he's a little shy so by talking I mean he would say hi and by the time I would look up to say hi back he was gone. Um, <laughs> So when I started college, <laughs> uh, one, night, one night I was in my dorm room and someone just came to my door and said, there's someone downstairs to see you. And it was Bobby. And over 37 years later, we're happily married. We're blessed with a wonderful daughter, grandsons, uh, two grandsons. Uh, we've just had a, a, a happy life. And uh, this past year, we, through a lot of praying and a lot of open houses and a lot of <laughs> searching the internet, um, God guided us to Lingle's Town to be closer to our daughter. 
and we're sort of still making our way. Um, some of our interests, we were very active in our community back home, as small as it was, so we're looking forward to breaking into some of that as, as the time gets, as we, as we get established and start learning, um, you know, different opportunities here. And we, uh, we like to travel when we can. We're readers, we're into history, um, fa <laughs> family. <laughs> Um, you know, we're just, we're, we're just open to new experiences and we're really looking forward to getting involved with this church and, and uh, making a home here. What has drawn you to St. Thomas? Well, once we settled into the new house, we, we wanted to find a church to become active in. And, uh, we started here with the full intention of we were going to come here one week and go somewhere else another week and another week. But honestly, from the minute we walked in the door, everyone has been so kind and welcoming. And it really felt like the church we grew up in and we've never gone anywhere else and we don't have any intention of doing so. <laughs> we, we just feel like we've found our home. Yeah. All right. Well, that's great to hear. <laughs> so, a little bit of their story, and um, I want to encourage you as our congregation, as a congregation, to be welcoming these folks. And apparently that's already happened, so nice job. And, <laughs> and to make space as we open up to a new family to be part of the church here, to be open to what they bring and then to be praying for them as we are encouraged to pray for one another, that that would be an ongoing ministry and reality for our time together. I'm going to lead us in some prayer for Bob and Leslie right now and uh, ask the elders who are with us this morning to come and join me up here, and we're going to try to maintain social distance. This is a little weird because normally we'd be right there laying hands on them, but we'll just sort of do that virtually, okay? Okay. And I'll ask the rest of you who are members here, just all of you, just stand and pray with us, will you? And if you'd like to reach your hands towards them as a sign of blessing on them, uh, let's do that. So Lord, we thank you for Bob and for Leslie and for your work in their lives. We thank you for their interest in following you. We thank you for their commitment to your body and ask that as they join in membership here at St. Thomas, that they would bring the gifts and resources with which you have blessed them and put them into play for your glory and for the building of your kingdom through this church and in this wider community. We ask God that they would knit in well to this congregation, that we as people would be quick to receive them and to make space for them. And we thank you, God, for the ways that you continue to be at work in people's lives drawing them to yourself, and knitting them into service. So we commit them to you, we give you thanks for them, and join in our thanks to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Oh, wait, we're not quite done. So um, there's one more piece. So normally, normally, what's normal anymore? Um, Pre-COVID, uh, we would follow this with a time of either people coming by to shake hands and say hello or something like that, or out in the foyer, you know, kind of create a, a reception line. We're not going to do that today, given uh, COVID. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Um, you've seen Bob and Leslie now, all right, without their masks. Now, with their masks on, they might look different, but when you see them here at church or in the parking lot, would you just come up to them and introduce yourselves to them so they get to know a few more people in church, and that will be our way of welcoming you in, um, in, in this era of COVID. So um, thank you, and I, I will shake your hand. So welcome to membership here at St. Thomas on behalf of the elders in the congregation. So We're glad to have you here. Thank you. And if you'll stay standing... Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Give thanks to the Lord for His unfailing love and wonderful deeds. Amen. 
Amen. You may be seated. The bold promises of this song move us into a time of confession, and we'll actually have our hymn following our time of confession. We're reminded of God, what God has promised to us, namely to care for us, to provide for us. And as we come before God now, we express again our reliance on God, our connection with God, our dependency on God. And as we do this, we also recognize that there are times when we drift when we try to take things on for ourselves, when we ignore God or turn away from God. And so it's helpful for us on a regular basis to pause, to reflect, to confess that drift, to ask God's help once more to stay focused and to follow the Lord who has committed himself to our care. So let us pray. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Amen. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer.
If you'll take a Bible and turn with me to John chapter 2 in those Pew Bibles, it's page 1511, page 1511 in the Blue Pew Bibles, John chapter 2, and we are continuing with these stories that reveal something about Jesus in this season of Epiphany. In John chapter 2, starting at verse 1, we hear the apostles say this, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew And then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Let's pray. For your word, Lord, we give you thanks for the scriptures that teach us and encourage us and draw us closer to you and bring us back from the brink. God, we're thankful. Speak to us now, we pray by your Holy Spirit. May we be attentive to your voice. Amen. Matthew and Luke both introduce Mary, the mother of Jesus, right in the start of their stories as they are talking about the birth of Jesus, and Mary is a key figure in those early stories. But for the Gospel of John, this is the first occasion when we hear of Mary. Jesus has already been baptized. He has started to call disciples. And after that, John introduces Mary. He is already in embarking on his public ministry before we meet Mary in this gospel. And interestingly enough, after this episode, we won't see her again until we come to the cross in John's gospel, where she will stand watching Jesus being crucified. But here at Cana, up in the northern region of Israel, there's a wedding going on, and Mary is there along with Jesus and his disciples, and Mary has come to attend. We don't know anything about who's getting married other than it's a friend, a friend of a friend, relative, don't know. But Mary's there, and she's not just being swept away in the emotion of the moment. She's paying attention to what's going on, and she notices that there's a problem. She wants to help. And so she maneuvers a bit behind the scenes. She doesn't make a scene, but she goes to Jesus with an observation more than a command. They've run out of wine, she says. Now, why even bring this up, and why mention this to Jesus? Well, if we follow the exchange a little bit further, what we discover is that this is an expression of her faith. She believes Jesus can do something about what's going on here. And his reply to her, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. On the face of it can sound harsh because we tend to import a tone. We see that first word, woman. Why isn't he saying mom or something a little more endearing? We tend to think he's saying, look, you know, just back off a little bit here, all right? That's how we might interpret this. And yet, there's no tonal markers in the text here. One of the things we discover about Jesus is that when people of faith approach him, asking him something, he often replies with a question. What do you want me to do? I want to see, one of them says. 
And the fact of coming to Jesus with an expression, with a question, with an expectation that he can do something suggests faith on the part of the person who approaches. And Jesus' question is meant, it seems, uh, almost designed to draw that faith out a little further. Can you voice that? Is that really what's going on in your heart? The next thing that happens is that Mary turns not to Jesus, doesn't feel rebuffed or doesn't seem to want to criticize him for a heartless remark. Instead, she goes to the servants and says, guy over there, do whatever he says. Another curious remark, right? And they're kind of, you know, you can imagine the servants saying, okay. Nearby stood six stone water jars. And Jesus said to the servants, fill them up with water. And so they did. Fill them to the brim. Now draw some out and take it to the master. And you maybe have heard this story before. He brings it to the master of the banquet who takes a sip and says, wow, this is the good stuff. Have you been holding out on us or what? You know, this is the good stuff right here. So Jesus you can see what's going on here. There's this sort of family trait. Mary wants to help, right? And now Jesus comes along. He wants to help as well, and he will provide that help. He will do it in a rather dramatic fashion. It's not just a glass or two of wine. It's these six stone jars full of water that become wine. So there's wine all over the place here, which leads me to the first of my sort of parenthetical remarks because I was raised in a corner of the church where wine and church just didn't mix. I was raised by people who said, no, we don't drink. We just, we're not going to drink. That isn't what we do. That's not what you should do. And so there was a little extra, not only what we do, but what other people do as well. A little bit extra edge to that. You know? And along the way, I've met people for whom Drinking wine, alcohol, is just not an issue. I have been with those that have been perfectly content not to drink, as well as with those who uh, heartily endorse what the Psalms say, that wine gladdens the heart. I have seen the effects of excessive interest in alcohol. And I have seen the effects of a sort of righteous indignation against alcohol. And I realize, just as a quick parenthetical remark, that the phrase of moderation in all things is, a good, is good wisdom, right? And also that conscience matters. It is not a sign of advanced maturity that you're able to drink. It's a difference in approach. It's a difference in conscience. There's got to be room for both, right? But here, in this story, there's no question. This is wine. And these are people who know what wine is and, even, and can tell the difference between good and uh, great wine. And now here is Jesus in the thick of it, in the middle of it. And now, second parenthetical remark, we need to do some math. All right, so I know this is church and all, and school isn't until, well, it's way in the past, right, for most of us, but some math. How many stone jars? Six. Six. Average containment of these stone jars, 20 to 30 gallons, the average would be? 25. 25. So six times 25 is 150 gallons. That's a lot of wine. Let's put this in... Um, Understandable terms. A bottle of wine is typically three quarters of a liter when you buy a bottle at the store, all right? Um, so I've, I've actually changed from where I grew up as far as my approach. Um, so average, uh, typical bottle is 750 liters, three quarters of a liter. Uh, we've got how many gallons of water? 150 gallons, that's roughly 600 liters, all right, which would mean it's roughly 750 bottles of wine. Now, that's a lot of wine by any measure. That's more than a person or even a couple could drink in a year, I think. Uh, that's a lot 
of wine. Uh, I, then I did one more calculation of this, 750 bottles. If you think about it in modern terms, you put 12 bottles in a case. All right, that comes to about just over 60 cases of wine. Now, we just recently moved, and our house still has a lot of boxes, but I'm trying to imagine 60 cases of wine in one of our rooms. That would take a lot of real estate just to store that. All right? So it's a lot, it's a lot of wine. And then one more feature to this. Uh, we're at a wedding, and Jesus has just given them this gift. Now, when we go to weddings, it's fairly common, right? When we go to weddings, we bring gifts to the people being married. And the, the gift tends to depend on who's getting married. If it's a child, it's a significant gift. If it's a, rel if it's a family member, it's, you know, down just a notch. If it's a friend, again, if it's a friend of a friend, you know, that's like a gift card to Bed Bath & Beyond. All right? Um, we won't put a dollar figure to it, but you get a rough idea of what we would typically give. This gift that Jesus has given, 750 bottles of wine, and according to the steward, this is the good stuff. Again, one more calculation. If a good bottle of wine is in the 30 to $40 range, that's actually probably more of a moderate bottle of wine, but just for argument's sake, this gift is worth somewhere between twenty dollars and $25,000 in our estimation. Now, that's a gift. That's a wedding gift. So this story, this story just unfolds the more you peel back on it. And I want to highlight a handful of things from this story. The first of them is actually to go over to verse 11 of chapter 2, where John makes an editorial comment. He says in verse 11 that what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. The first point to make here is this description John gives to what's happened as a sign. We would call this a miracle, and rightly so. John doesn't use that word in his gospel. He uses the word sign because he wants to make a point, namely how a sign points to something. Now, we might admire signs. Some signs are really well made. Some signs have invaluable information on them. But we rarely just focus on the sign and stay there. We typically pay attention to what the sign is telling us. And John's intention is very similar to that. This is a sign. It's meaning to point us on to something else so we can get all wrapped up in you know, how much wine and the quality of the wine and the value of it. And those are interesting ideas. But the main thing here is that it points to the glory of the Lord. And by glory, John is wanting us to understand that this means to show us the fullness of God in a bodily form. This is meant to show us the divinity of Jesus, the power, the ability, the care, the concern that he has. Now, we know from reading the Gospels that people in that day had difficulty accepting Jesus as the Messiah, as the one who would rescue and then restore people. That was, a, that was an open question for a lot of people, and there were a number of skeptics that just weren't ready to say yes to that. And it was also difficult and perhaps even harder to see Jesus as God. People bucked at that notion as well. And I'm not sure that uh, that was unique to that time either. Isn't it still the case that folks wonder about Jesus' efficacy? Is Jesus really capable of saving? Wonder about Jesus' divinity. Yeah, he's a nice guy. He's a good teacher, a moral exemplar. Yeah, great. But surely there are other ways to fashion life, other ones to whom we can give our allegiance, right? Do we have to elevate this one? Signs like this point to who Jesus is, that he is this Messiah, this Savior, this Rescuer, this Restorer, that he is divine. And John says, if your eyes are open, you'll see that. Now, another idea from this story that if we think about this sign as pointing to Jesus as being God, then we notice through this story what Jesus is showing us about God's character and God's nature. In fact, this is a big part of his ministry in coming to earth to show us what God is like. 
Here, we see the extravagance and the abundance of God on display. Now, these are great ideas, right, as far as thinking about God being extravagant and abundant. If you were to think about an example of extravagance or abundance that God has something to do with, anything come to mind? My first thought goes to nature and all the extravagance and abundance that we see in nature. You see, for, this is not a good time of year to be thinking about this, but the trees, all the different kinds of trees and all the leaves on the trees and the birds that fill the trees and fly through the skies. A couple weeks ago, Sue and I were in Florida and we were walking on a beach that's um, known for its shelling. And you get out there early in the morning and people, you know, it's just, it's packed. I mean, they need to put up stoplights at some of the corners. There's so many people on the beach with their bags and their sticks and all the stuff bending down and collecting these shells. Just as far as you can see, there's shells scattered across these beaches. Every one of those shells have been filled by a little sea critter. You know, that's an abundance. Stars in the sky and amoeba and big things and all that. There's a lot of abundance in nature, but we're not limited to that. If you think about your own life where God has been active in your life, what abundance can you come up with? How many people do you know, for instance? How many people do you care about? How many people do you like? There's a lot of them, right? What about how many days you've had? We tend to think that, well, yeah, I get tomorrow. I get today, I get tomorrow, and I get a bunch of days after that, right? We've had a lot of days. That's an abundance. Opportunities? Have things come your way? Provision? Has God blessed your life? The opening of the letter to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul says, let's praise and thank God for the spiritual blessings. And then he goes through this long list of categories of ways that we've been blessed. And it's like, yeah, that's right. When I start to think about it, God's done this and this and this and this. He's given this and this and this and this. There's an abundance. There's an extravagance there. And it's on display here. Jesus could have taken a half of a stone jar full of water and said, here, this will get you through, right? But he doesn't do that. It just flows. There's lots. And that tumbles us into our third point, where this happens. It's a wedding, which is such a great setting for a miracle. And happening at a wedding, this tells us something else about Jesus, right? Because Jesus is showing up at a very ordinary human event. He doesn't just appear when we're in church. Here he is at a wedding. It's like we're meant to understand, and other scriptures push us in this direction, that whoever we are, whatever we're involved in, wherever we find ourselves, the Lord is there. And it's good to consider how the Lord is there. Sometimes in our mind's eye, when we think about the Lord, we think of one who is kind of stern and dour, you know, like one of our great-grandparents, maybe. I've got a picture of some of my ancestors that I put it's somewhere in the mix. When we unpack everything, we'll find it again. But my brother put this together, all these ancestors. It's a family tree. It's a photo family tree, right? And when I look back about two generations, there are all these Germans just scowling. You know? I don't know if that was required to get your picture made, but all my relatives scowl. And I think that's kind of influenced my view of God sometimes. I think of God as scowling. But this is such a great picture to see Jesus at a wedding. It's hard to imagine him just standing in a corner with his arms crossed, scowling at people. I, I actually kind of like to think about Jesus, you know, um, dancing there, but I don't know. That might be a bridge too far. The first miracle that Jesus performs, according to John, takes place at a party. And it's one more indication of how difficult it is to pin Jesus down, to reduce him to a single phrase or idea. This is why we need a collection of stories and pictures such as the Gospels provide. They show us his range. 
that he is contemplative and, and outgoing, that he is stern on occasion, but also delighted. He looks into the detail, and he also is aware of the big picture. This is someone worth knowing. And as we turn in his direction, as we find ourselves saying yes, we get to know him better. And as that happens, as we open more and more of our lives to him, as we ask him to join us in more and more of what we engage in, as he walks with us, what happens then? Let's pray. Bringing our thanks and praise for your goodness and grace, O oh God. For the abundance that flows from your hands, help us to recognize your many good gifts. And would you help us to be attentive to the notes of your presence, to walk believing that you're with us, to live out of that confidence. Amen. As we move to a time of prayer, we can look around this room and see answers to prayer. We know that there are continued needs as well. And as we open our mail and read the various feeds that we attend to, we know that there are a lot of things going on in our neighborhood, our community, our state, our nation, our world. These things we can bring to prayer as well. So let's spend some moments doing that right now. We do pray for the nations, Lord, for those tasked with the responsibility of leading. We pray that they would be looking for you, that they would be pursuing what leads to the common good. We pray for your church. We thank you for the leavening influence your church has and ask God that your people might see themselves as lights, as salt, as yeast, that they would bring good into the neighborhoods that they populate, and that they would do good. And we pray for this church as we thank you for what you are doing here, what you have done, what you are currently doing, for the doors you are opening in the days ahead we pray for courage and we pray for wisdom. We pray, God, that we might use wisely the resources with which you've blessed us. And we pray for people, people we know, people who are close to us, people we hear about, who tug at our hearts. We ask for your good work in these lives. And we pray for ourselves that you would help us want a life that pleases you, that you would guide us along this path that you are marking out, that you'd help us to trust you, that you'd give us strength to deal with what we're facing, that you'd increase our patience, deepen our faith, ground us in the confidence of your love for us, your grace towards us. We bring our thanks and praise and we do this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul encouraged us to be cheerful givers. The scriptures encourage us to be generous in our giving, reminding us that it's God who provides and that we have an opportunity to participate in the work of the kingdom as we bring our gifts here, as we offer them elsewhere as well for others who are engaged in ministry that honors the Lord and blesses people. So if you've brought a gift today, we've got plates by the door. You can use the online portal or mail to the office as well. And let's ask a blessing on these offerings today. Recognizing, God, that all good gifts come from you. And so we return our thanks even as we bring these gifts. We pray that they might be used for your glory. That they would encourage the doing of good, especially where there is need. And so we commit them to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. We have a few announcements before we close this morning. Next Sunday, we will have one single service right here in the sanctuary at 930. And then the quarterly meeting will follow in Fellowship Hall with an update from the deacons, the elders, and the pastor. And I believe we're going to have a little bit of refreshments between there too, so you'd want to stay for that. Offering envelopes for 2022 have arrived. You can pick yours up in the foyer 
And if you would like to deliver a box to a friend or a family member, we encourage you to do that. Bob and Leslie, we will have a box ready for you next week. Welcome. Also, the giving statements are in the foyer. We're going to have to mail those that aren't picked up this week in order for them to arrive by the end of the month. So if you want to look through and maybe pick up one of those for a friend or family member, that would be helpful as well. The midweek Bible study is looking at the book of Judges. You can drop in on Wednesdays through Zoom. You can get the link for that through the weekly update in the email. And if you don't get the weekly email, please call the office and Carol will fix you up with that. Grocery cards will be available right after the service. See Patty Hanawalt, and she can fix you up with a grocery card. Also, if you would like to take a poinsettia home, we still have several on the altar here, so we encourage you to take a poinsettia home and maybe give it to a friend or family member, somebody that you know is in the hospital perhaps. Finally, let's be praying for the hospitality team and the community impact team as they work together and try to make plans in light of the ongoing COVID crisis. We'd like to be able to get together socially, but that's kind of difficult right now. So please keep them in your prayers. Thank you. In the Gospel of John, we read that when Jesus was on the cross, there were some people at the foot of the cross watching this crucifixion, among them Mary and also John. And there's an exchange when Jesus looks at John and says, here's your mother, and looks at Mary and says, here's your son, and puts them together. There's reliable tradition that says that John and Mary, at some point after Jesus returned to heaven, relocated to the town of Ephesus which is in modern day Turkey on the coast and spent the rest of their years pretty much there. And tradition grew up around them, around that saying that they lived there and would have had an influence. And I can just imagine, this is not in the Bible, but I can just imagine the two of them sitting together and talking about their memories during the days of Jesus. And I'm, it has to have happened. At one point, Mary looks at John and says, you remember that wedding at Cana? And John says, do I? And they probably told that story to each other and others around them more than once. To the point where it may have, you know, just kind of circulated around Ephesus. Now I'm, I'm really ru running into the realm of speculation. But let's imagine these two there and they're talking about their experiences with Jesus and other people listening in on that and wanting to hear those stories and them coming back to this wedding at Cana and that evidence of abundance and extravagance on the part of the Lord. Some years after Jesus returned, the Apostle Paul spent some time in Ephesus, and a church grew up there. And Paul would write a letter back to this town. Please stand. And this is our benediction for this morning, Ephesians chapter 3. And verse 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And God's people said, amen, amen. amen.